Um, thank you, everyone, and welcome. Um, we're excited to present Telling Your Story, Using Data to Communicate Public Works Needs to Budget Departments. Uh, my name is Matthew Largen with the Withers Ravenel, and I'm excited that you all are here with us today. Um, in this event, we'll be listening to our esteemed experts, Megan Powell and Shannon Moore, on how public works departments can effectively align plans and goals, identify resource gaps, set project priorities, establish timelines, and coordinate projects to maximize efficiency. Uh, this is very important as we're entering the new part of the fiscal year. Um, but before we dive into the meat of our conversation today, uh, I wanted to provide some background uh, on our speakers. Uh, starting with Megan, Megan is a funding and asset management uh, project manager at Withers Ravenel and was recently selected to be the 2024-25 president of the North Carolina Local Government Budget Association. In recent years, she has worked uh, on grant administration for American Recovery and Reinvestment Act funds and sustainability projects that involved community outreach. As a budget manager and internal auditor, she has managed teams that have secured millions of dollars of funding for local government clients. Her day-to-day -day work in involves developing best practices, policies, and procedures, complying with local bu uh, budget, government budget and fiscal control act, and ensuring compliance with all local, state, and federal laws. And moving over to Shannon, she has more than 20 years of experience as a financial professional. She serves as Withers, Withers Ravenel's Director of Finance Services. She works with private and public uh, sectors, and she recently served as the Finance Director for the City of Salisbury. Her responsibilities included overall oversight of city finances and debt management, while also leading the city's accounting, purchasing, budgeting, and customer service departments. In additional roles with Salisbury, Shannon had responsibility for budgeting, utility rate models, and enhancements to the capital improvement plan program. Now that you all have been introduced to our, uh, our team, uh, I'm gonna pass the conversation over to Megan and Shannon. But before I do that, I wanna hit a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, this webinar will be recorded uh, and shared on Withers Ravenel's YouTube channel in the coming days. Um, so if you wanna share this to someone else that you might know that couldn't make it today, please do so. And then secondly, if you have any questions during the event, please submit them in the chat. Uh, Megan or Shannon or even myself will uh, make sure that they are answered during the conversation or at the conclusion of the event during our Q&A. Uh, without, further, without further ado, uh, take it away, Megan. Thanks, actually we're gonna have Shannon kick us off to start with um, and we'll change that slide. Awesome. Thanks, Matthew, for the great introduction, and I am happy to be joining uh, Megan here, my esteemed colleague at Withers, to kind of talk about incorporating project budgets. Um, so first, Megan, let's just kind of talk about um, your experience and best practices in how departments can incorporate their project budgets into um, city and county budgets. Sometimes we're talking small projects in the thousand dollar range. Sometimes we're talking projects in, you know, the multi-million dollar range. So any best practices or advice you'd like to give? Uh, to start with, and this will be kind of a continuing theme throughout the course of, you know, the next hour that we have together is communication, 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 communication. The most important thing that you can do in incorporating things and getting things started is communicate between your department, between your management, whether that includes a budget department or not, or whether it's just your city manager or your finance director. You need to all make sure that you are on the same page and continuously talking about what's needed. And the best way to do that is to start early. So that's kind of the, the overreaching best practice is talk to everybody about what's going on. Don't operate in a silo. You may think you may have, um, have it covered and are able to handle things and you may completely be able to handle things, but you got to let everybody else on the team know what's going on because there may be outside factors that you're not aware of that comes to procurement and things we'll talk about a little bit later that we just need to all make sure on the same page. It's a lot easier to get stuff done correctly the first time than have to go back and fix it, especially if it involves state and federal grant funds. So Megan, what's your preferred method of communication with the budget department or what have you seen to be most effective um, in your experience? I think it depends on the organization. Um, I think you know your organization and your department, budget department management better than I would. Um, it, it, 
it depends. So if email is a good way to document things, put it in emails. If, if sitting down and chatting every now and then and talking about what the needs are and things are in person and then maybe following up with an email, that can work too. Um, I, I really say it varies. Um, it also, you know, some of that is varied based off of your departmental structure. If you're in a larger organization that has a more rigid structure with, you know, hierarchy versus maybe a small organization where, you know, you see someone getting coffee in the morning, you may just end up chatting with them then. So um, it, it, I think it just depends. And also find out what that other person's com preferred communication style is. If they really prefer email, it may be best to sit down and write an email, whereas you may want to talk to them over a cup of coffee. Um, balancing that to make sure that both people's communication needs are met are also very important. Okay, great advice. Um, so let's talk about two common scenarios. The first being what to do if you don't get funding. Um, any kind of best practices you want to share there in terms of how to make sure your funding requests um, get considered in the future? We can do that. One thing, but let's back up one second real quick. We have a quick poll to get people started talking about communicating with people. So you'll see it popping up on your screen right now, um, asking you guys, how often do you communicate with your budget department? And if you don't have a budget department, that can be interchanged with your city manager or finance department. We'll give everyone just one second to talk about that. Okay, it looks like the answers are starting to roll in. Um, most often people are saying either when only when they have to or during budget season and weekly seems to be the other most common one. So um, if you are not communicating with your budget department or finance director or city manager um, and you're one of those weekly or only during budget season, I would advise you to start doing that more frequently. Um, and we'll talk about why in just a little bit about getting funding and not getting funding, why that is so important. Okay, so let's go, like you were saying earlier about not getting funding. Switch back to that, Shannon. So what... Oh, so go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, what strategies do you have that have worked effectively um, in terms of helping get funding in the future? So right now we're at the beginning of the budget year. Um, you probably got, hopefully, some of the things you asked for in the last budget cycle, but probably didn't get everything you asked for. So right now is a great time to start looking at what you can do for next year. And I know it seems like the beginning of the fiscal year, and you've got a long time before you get to that budget process again. But budgeting, as, as some of you that are on here that are in budget departments know, it is a year-round process internally. So now's the time to really start looking at what you can do. One thing that's a really great thing you can do is, if you're a utility, um, a rate study. Look at when the last time you've had a rate study. Um, if it's been more than a couple of years, updating that is um, going to be a great thing to look at. Um, it's going to really go through and look at your department, see um, if you're getting the, the best uh, revenue source available. Um, you can also look at a financial analysis that's really going to help with long-term planning and securing future revenues. Um, if you haven't done one in the last five years, like I said before, it's probably a great time to do it. We all know what's happened in the last five years between COVID, uh, pandemics, high inflations, high growth, personnel changes. Um, a lot of our organizations are aging, and some of the people that have been char in charge over the last couple of years, they're not there anymore. We've lost that institutional knowledge. So. All of those things can factor into um, why it's important to keep those rate studies up to date. Um, even more recently, just this summer, most of us have experienced drought if you are a utility. That can affect things, and it's going to be helpful to look at those things moving forward for utilities. Outside of utilities, looking at your facilities, streets, parks, and recreation, all those things that have to do with capital, looking at a financial analysis can help you determine what you need to do and what funding you may need in the future to incorporate things like capital um, and capital improvement plans. Um, one other thing you can do if you didn't get funding is look at your project. What are you trying to do and see how it aligns with your board's visions and goals? Do they have a strategic plan? Does this fit into it? If it doesn't, you may need to look at ways that it could be potentially modifying it to fit in a strategic plan. Um, 
if they don't have one, just again, aligning it with the board's goals really increases your chance of funding. Um, this is the, a good time to start reevaluating that capital improvement plan if you have one. And if you don't have one, might be a good time to start planning for one, even if it's one that your board doesn't officially adopt. An informal capital improvement plan is always a good thing to have to make sure that you're planning properly for the future. Um, using work order management systems. If you don't have one, those are a great way to help you track your data. There's a lot of different ones out there. There's some that are great for larger governments. There's some that are great for smaller governments. If you can't afford to have one, an Excel spreadsheet where you start tracking, hey, we fixed this air conditioning system. This is what we did. This is how much it costs can help you look over time to determine, is it time to replace that air conditioning system? Um, it broke a bunch. We had to fix it a bunch. That's not really gonna tell a board what they need to do. Saying we spent, um, a million dollars over the last five years fixing this HVAC unit and oh wait, a whole new one's a million dollars too, shows that it's time to replace it. These, you know, simple things that you can do to just start tracking it. Um, and if you keep those things updated, it makes it really easy when uh, the manager or a board member says, hey, what's going on here? Can you tell me what's happening here? Um, I got a complaint from a citizen that the air conditioning at the community center was out. What's going on here? You can pull that information quickly to satisfy the, the questions from that board member, member be um, responsive to the community, and also it helps you with tracking when you need a new one. Um, so just some simple things that you can do to help show your need for funding. Now is the time to start preparing those things if you do not already have them in place. They are in place, now's a good time to update them. One other thing about funding, if you didn't receive local funding, and you don't have a grant professional on staff, might be time to start talking to grant professionals about alignment with state and federal grant and loan programs. There's a lot of different funding out there, not quite as much as we've seen over the last couple of years with the ARPA funds being spent, but there's still a significant amount of grant funding out there. Talking to a grant professional, if you don't have one on staff, it's now's the time to start that process to get funding over the next fiscal couple of fiscal years. So, um, what, um, Matthew, if you put poll number two up, I wanted to ask people, and this is kind of a short answer question, so you can be one word, two words, whatever works for you. How do you use financial analysis to support your budget request? We'll give everyone just a moment to respond to that. Doesn't look like anyone's answering, so I guess I put you guys to sleep with that first one. Um, so we'll go ahead and move on to the next section of what to do if you get funding. Shannon? Yeah, and real quick before we move on to that, Megan, I think you made some very good points, especially in evaluating the funding strategy for the organization. Um, you know, we work with a lot of clients that they have those 10 year CIP programs and oftentimes in our vetting conversations, we find out that, you know, there might be a project in year 3, 4, or even sometimes year 5 that aligns with a current grant opportunity. And so that year 5 project, a lot of times, you know, moves up into kind of a number 1 priority just because there's outs outside funding mechanisms to pay for it. So, again, I think evaluating that 10 year CIP um, against funding strategies is, is definitely very important. So with that, Megan, yeah, let's move on to kind of the next topic. Um, what are the steps that you need to take if you do receive funding in your annual budget process? So the answer is that it's time to start putting those plans in action. You know, it may seem like you have a long time in the next fiscal year to get these projects started, but the sooner you can start on them, the better. Um, one thing that a lot of times people don't think about when it comes to the plan that, you know, they're very focused on, I've got to do this. I've got to put shovels in the ground. This is how long it's going to take. But we've learned, especially over the last couple of years, ordering things sometimes takes a significant amount of time. And depending on the type of revenue you have, you need to put it out for an RFP or an RFQ. Things may need to be planned. You may need an engineer to sign off on things. Um, so some of these projects can take significantly longer than it seems like they're going to take. So the best thing to do is start now. You may not actually start that project for a couple of months, but you need to start having the conversations 
with your procurement people, if you have them, your finance department, your budget department, your manager, again, that communication, start talking to them about what steps need to be taken before you can start putting that shovel in the ground for the project. Um, I check um, when you start talking to them, look at your local ordinances too. Um, even if they're local funds, there's a lot of um, ordinances out there. Various um, local governments have different requirements for what you need to do for those things um, and start that process early. One thing that you might want to consider in this process, if you're having to put an RFQ out, and if you, especially if you know you've got a lot of projects coming over the next couple of years, might want to consider looking at an on call. On calls are a great way for RFQs to go out where you can select multiple different firms to help you with that work, and you only have to do the procurement once <laughs> instead of doing it every single time. A lot of local governments are starting to turn to these because it just basically has a consultant kind of hand picked, ready to go. You've already vetted them. Whenever the time comes for the project to start, you can get moving with it and can avoid those steps year after year. Um, a lot of people don't like those for transparency purposes. Um, I would definitely argue that you can do them, redo them every couple of years so you can still be extremely transparent with that process while still having it to help you out a little bit. So that's a great way to do it. Another thing we talked about this again already is rate studies and financial analysis. It helps with long-term planning, just like we said before. You wanna update them um, if you haven't done that recently um, or, or go ahead and get those started. Budgeting is a year round process and it doesn't seem like that. I know a lot of budget offices maybe take July off, maybe the beginning of August, but they're starting right back already for this fiscal year planning for next fiscal year. If you know you're going to need a rate study or financial analysis, now is the time to start that process, especially if you're doing it in house. If you're using a consultant for that, there's a lot of those going on and they need time to work with your staff to get that process done. It takes more than just a month or two to put those together. They're six, eight, nine month projects most of the time. Um, so go ahead and get started on that. If you wait till January, I'm sure somebody can help you out, but it's gonna be a really tight turnaround and it's gonna be very difficult to have the best analysis out there if you wait too long. Another thing is making sure that your CIPs are implemented effectively and included in your yearly budgets. This is one of those things that it comes back to communication. If you're constantly talking with your budget department, you've got your CIP, and again, that could just be internal. It may not be a board adopted CIP. If you're constantly letting them know, okay, these are the projects we've got this year, these need to happen, and this is why they need to happen. It can, it'll start to be more routine after a couple of years in the process. And hopefully those things will just kind of be included as part of your, your budget every single year. You may even have a line item for them within your budget where you just say, okay, I need $500,000 this year. Next year, I'm going to need $600,000. But if you're letting that budget department know what's on the horizon, it's going to be really easy to just get those things in there and just slide right in and be part of the regular yearly budget process. So by doing a lot of these things, you're really helping build that trust, communicating with your um, other departments, your board, the public, and it just becomes kind of second nature and you can just keep moving along and get a lot done for your community. So um, we'll go ahead and skip poll number three because I forgot about that. And the question was, what are the immediate steps you take once you receive funding? And I forgot to put that up there. So we'll just skip right over that since I already talked about it and we'll move on to the next area. Shannon. Awesome. So let's talk about telling your story with data. Um, one of the most important aspects of securing and maintaining your funding streams is to be able to tell your story effectively. Sometimes that's with upper management, um, your town councils. Um, so Megan, share with me your thoughts on effective ways that you have seen local governments um, share their story with data. So again, the theme of communication resonates back on with this next section as well. Um, talking with your budget department and your management and letting them know what's going, what's going on, using tools like uh, work order systems to help you with that. Um, how many work orders do you think permissions and work is how many times did you have to go out? How many potholes did you fill? How many times did you go do this and this? It's, it's, it's letting your departments know 
what's going on, how often you're doing it, how much that costs when you do that. Um, working with your departments, your budget department's a great resource to help you determine what those performance measures are. They can help you talk about what you're already doing and how you can effectively measure that to tell your story of what's going on. Um, a lot of times this helps with getting projects funded. It can also help with new personnel if needed. Um, when I was in the budget department, I would always hear, well, we're busy. We're all busy. How, tell me why you need that new person. What's going on? Why do you need a new technician? Well, I'm busy. We're all really busy. I know. We all work a lot. It's all crazy all the time. But, but tell me why. Um, and we were able with this specific department. This was um, the building inspections department. They were able to find a metric with the state that says, on average, they should do 10 inspections per day. Okay. Well, we were already tracking because they had great performance measures and had been tracking their stuff for a long time. They were doing on average 18 inspections per day. Well, we know what building inspectors do. That's they're not going to be doing a great job if they're doing too many. So it wasn't safe, but we found a, a kind of a baseline metric. There's those out there for everything you can think of. Look at what you're doing and figure out what's considered effective. And then that can help you tell that story of why you need this. Sometimes it's personnel, sometimes it's projects, you know, new HVAC systems like we talked about. Oh, a new roof because you've repaired leaks on this roof 15 times and every single time it's cost you $100,000. All of that information goes into telling your story effectively. So um, if you do have a budget department, your budget department can be your biggest asset to your manager and to your board because they're the ones that are going to be front and center. They're the ones that are meeting with those board members, maybe behind the scenes to prep them for budget. And they're the ones that can be your biggest advocate. So communicate with them so they can communicate on your behalf to the board and elect or to the elected officials and your manager. Um, one, some tips to, to with that. Um, avoid jargon. I, you know, we work in an engineering firm, Shannon and I, we're not engineers. I hear more jargon and more RFP, RFQ, which we know what those are, but I hear more three letter terms than I've ever heard in my entire life. I had no idea what any of it meant. I started to have to make a little definition, like a keynote, or like sticky note on my side. I'm like, oh, this is, this is what this means. This is what PER means. Um, that's preliminary engineering for had no idea what that was before I came here. Um, but avoid using that jargon. You may talk about it with your staff. You may, you know, say all the, you know, the different shortcuts and names. Don't do that when you're talking to budget and especially when you're talking to the board. Um, they're going to get just as confused as I was <laughs> and they're less likely to want to fund it. You know, you may have some great people that are like, wait, hold on, stop. Tell me what that means. Let's back up one second. More often than not, you're not going to have that. And if it, it starts to go over their head, they're just going to say, mm, no, I don't think we need that. You're not telling your story effectively that way. So avoid jargon. Try to simplify the complex information that you have to make sure that your message is clear. What Public Works does is incredibly complex, and you've just got to make sure that people understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, another way, sometimes if you have time, get creative with presenting your data using charts, graphs, um, videos. If you have a public information officer, use them to talk about what you're doing, um, especially once you get a project started. If you are putting in a new sidewalk, talk about it because people see those. Those are very visible. This is what we're doing. This is how much it cost. This, if it was grant funded, this is and this is what it's going to do for the community. It's going to connect these two neighborhoods. It's going to make it easy so kids can walk to school, you know, better and, and safer. Um, tell your story and make sure you're putting it out there in the community. So there's lots of different things that your PIs probably have access to that can um, do great little videos. Um, and that's that's just one fun way to do it. Um, they can also tag into social media to keep your community and your board involved. There's nothing that board members love doing more than talking about what the town's doing, how it's doing it well, and what it's doing for the citizens. So um, making sure that you're celebrating and talking about all the things that you're doing is really important. Um, for future funding, because if that board member says, oh, everyone, you know, my neighbors were talking all about this project and how great it was, they are more likely to do those things in the future. <laughs> so, um, I believe, yes, okay. I think that's kind of it for telling your story with data. Um, Shane, is there anything else I missed in this section? 
Yeah, I think that's a great high level discussion on using data. Um, I know a lot of our clients have a lot of data that is readily accessible. Um, I'll just add that that information and that data oftentimes really helps tell compelling stories, especially in funding grants. Um, you know, if it's tracking things like I and I, you know, how many gallons of spills um, you have for SSOs, things like that, all that data is really, really critical because most funding applications are priority based. Um, so the greater your community has a need um, for funding, typically the greater opportunity they have to secure some of those grants. So data is really, really important, especially when you're seeking outside funding. Right. And but yes, great, you, great discussion, Megan. You probably already have this data is, are you using it? Are you tracking it? It's, it's likely already there. So it's not going to be a huge leap to start tracking it and utilizing it to tell your story. So with that, Megan, let's kind of move on to um, the last kind of topic, um, and that's taking that data and being able to utilize it with softwares um, and tools. Any um, demonstrations or examples that you'd like to talk about how you've seen clients really successfully use some of that data? Sure. Um, before we do that, let's go to poll number four, Matthew. Um, and it's what software tools, if any, are you currently using and have they improved your process? So we'll give everyone just a second to respond to that. And while people are responding, we'll go ahead and kind of keep talking and we'll, we'll come back to this if anyone has any really great ones that are out there. Um, so there's a lot of different tools that are out there um, that you can utilize um, for this. Um, Power BI is a great one that is inexpensive. Um, anyone that, that um, is pretty good at Excel can learn Power BI. Um, so you probably have somebody on your staff that either if they don't know how to use it already can probably learn it pretty easy. It's not an extremely difficult piece of software to learn. Um, but there's a lot of different things out there and, and those, excuse me, Power BI specifically can help you create dashboards that you can put on your website, you can put on your social media, you can get it out there and it shows your community what their taxes are paying for, what their rates are paying for. If they're paying their water bill, especially if you've had to raise rates, people are saying, well, what am I paying for? It just keeps getting more expensive. What are we paying for? We're showing them, well, it's great, but you know, we had to replace that water treatment facility or we had to upgrade it. And it those are very expensive. Showing people what their taxes are going for, especially if you've had to raise taxes or raise rates, helps calm them down, understand what's happening. Um, and it's a great communication tool for um, your community and for your board. Um, board visioning is another thing. That's not really a software tool. Um, if your board doesn't have a strategic plan, and a lot of small communities do not have strategic plans, um, getting your board together, and this is some, something that you're, you're probably your manager would be doing, not necessarily public works or budget, um, helping them align their goals so that way all the departments, the manager has a clear vision of what that board wants for the community is a great thing to do. Um, and it's just some of it's just basic needs and some of it is community desires and long term planning. Um, so those are just a few things you can do. And I'm not seeing anybody bringing anything in the poll. I was hoping everyone would be uh, saying, hey, I do this and I do the, this so we can talk about it. Um, but there's a lot of different software out there and some of it is not expensive at all. Um, there, there are ones that are more expensive that are more comprehensive, easier to use, take less staff time, um, but they're, they're varied ones out there. So that's it, I think. Anything else, Shannon? Awesome, and I don't see anything in the chat. I think Matthew is helping us monitor the chat. Um, Want to make sure I didn't miss anything in the chat. Um, so yeah, Megan, this has been a really great discussion. Really appreciate um, your time. Hope the audience has found this uh, session to be very informational and, and helpful. Um, again, remember the key to successful project planning is to make sure that you are budgeting and having continuous communication with your departments. Um, you are effectively storytelling and using the right tools to communicate um, your projects to your staff and your board. Um, and so before we kind of close,
Rose, wanted to again say thank you to Megan. Thanks to Matthew for moderating. And again, I don't see anything in the chat that we might have missed, but hope everyone has a fantastic day. Thanks, Shannon. Uh, before we completely close out, if anyone has any specific questions or challenges that they want us to address, feel free to please put that in the chat now and we can go over those as, um, as we're kind of wrapping up. Is there anything coming in? I can't see the chat. Uh, nothing's coming in yet. Um, one question, though, that I did have, uh, Megan, um, as you were going through all this, and this comes kind of from a uh, communication background on my end, but um, have you seen, like, what is the most preferred method as far as just getting that ball rolling, whether it is an email or starting with that presentation? Because I think sometimes the, the most daunting thing for a communication person and in other areas too is just getting that ball rolling. Um, so is there a preferred method? Because I know you noted, you know, videos could be a fun way to communicate, but um, what what are you seeing as that, that preferred Kickstarter? So you were asking about just communication within departments on how to get that started? Yeah, yeah, because there, there's often a divide and in, in, in different dynamics. Um, I know that some people in, in a certain department in, in our company prefer email versus a, a Teams message. So um, how, how might one bridge that? Yeah, so I like to start with either a, like a, a Teams message or Teams call or an in-person if it's somebody locally and talk to them and I straight up ask, what do you, how do you like to communicate? Do you want me to text you? Do you want me to send you an email? Um, do we wanna sit down and have coffee or lunch together? Or do we just wanna have a standing meeting once a month to talk about things? Um, it may not be the, the preferred communication style for me, but meeting that person in the middle and you know maybe it's not always meeting face-to-face -face if they like face-to-face -face and you really prefer email. Sometimes it can be a mix of both. So asking that person, what, how do you want to communicate? What is gonna work best for you um, is gonna one, help you communicate better, but it also shows an extension of, of you're, you're wanting them to trust you. You're wanting a good, a good relationship. And it's kind of, not really an olive branch per se, but you're, you're putting something out there and saying, I wanna work with you. How can we work together best? Let's talk about it. Let's figure out what's gonna work best. Um, and if you both really love email, you may have that one conversation and then everything else is on email um, and you can go from there. But just figuring out what everyone's preferred communication style is um, and just asking that question, being upfront with it, I have found to be the most effective way um, with, with doing, dealing with that. And it's more so that you have to go and kind of initiate that rather than it coming to you too in those situations as well. So. And if you already have a great relationship with somebody, let's say you, you work with your budget department, great. Um, sometimes it's still okay to ask that question. Say, hey, we've worked with you for a couple of years now. We always email. Does that work for you? Um, does it not? Should we should we start meeting in person? Um, asking them that question again shows you you know it's working, but you want it to be better. You want to make sure that you're working with them the way they want to. And I think it really goes a long way with people just asking that question. Um, you thinking about what works for them as well um, is, is really helpful. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I just know that even in, in my day to day, I just get stuck in my own ways. And it's like, this makes total sense to me. It, why did it not make sense to the next person? So uh, I appreciate right. you expanding on that. So. We all do that. I mean, we get stuck in our ways. We know what works best for us, but talking to somebody else and, and again, meeting somebody in the middle is a, is goes so far in establishing trust and great working relationship. Yep. I'm not seeing any uh, additional questions, um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap things up here today. Uh, just for a reminder for everyone that's still here, um, this has been recorded. Um, it will be uploaded to Withers Ravenel's YouTube channel in the coming days. Um, so feel free to shoot this out to someone that you uh, might know that that needs to hear this and and uh, Feel free to you know reach out to Megan or Shannon uh, with any further questions that you all might have. So, uh, with that being said, thank you all for joining today, and, and thank you, of course, Megan and Shannon for for sharing this. It's been very insightful, and and we appreciate your all's time. Thank you. Thank you all.